So uh, a couple years back, uh, we were doing an outreach uh, out, out in the park over here at Hand in Hand Park. This is an event we used to call, it was Summer Splash. We would, um, it was all things water, like water guns, water balloons, watermelon. Like we, we had a blast out there. And I, I was out there with, with my uh, video gimbal re- recording something, you know, like so we could have some cool footage of like the kids splashing each other. And, and in the process of this, this kid walks up to me and goes, hey, are you, are you a YouTuber? Well, as, as a matter of fact, I'm like, I am. And then I'm thinking to myself, that this is what famous feels like. Like, you know, like I, I'm, I'm out in public. Somebody I don't know me, know, knows me. They recognize me from the internet. Uh, and, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, buddy, I, I am a YouTuber. Have you seen one of my videos or have you subscribed or something? And, and immediately I went from what it feels like to be famous to what it feels like to be humbled. And he goes, no, dude, I just saw you with that video gimbal, and nobody would have that in public unless they were a YouTuber. I was like, oh, man. <laughs> uh, so, this, this month, we're, we're talking about missions. And one of the things that we talk about often is we, we want our missionaries to be household names. We want our missionaries to be famous within our house. That, that when, when they do come home on furlough and they do visit us and they're introducing themselves to us, we're like, I already know you, man. I've been praying for you for like the last four years. And I, and I know your kids' names and I know what you're doing in ministry. And, and, and I, I want our, our, our missionaries to be household names. And there's a few reasons why I want our missionaries to be household names. We, we want them to be household names so that they, they feel loved and cared for. Like when, when, they, when they come, they, like this, this is a little piece of home for them. And they, they love being here because they know that the people here love them and care for them. I, I want them to be household names so that when we do things like Kingdom Builders Fund and we're raising funds for a, a, a particular a worthy project that they're taking on, we, we can raise funds effectively because you're like, well, yeah, I know those guys. I like those guys. I've been praying for those guys. And it makes it easier to, to cast a vision for that. But one of the main reasons... I want our missionaries to be household names so that we'll pray for them. Um, it's interesting when, when we give the Holy Spirit information to work with, a, a palette to paint with, he can speak to you in, in ways that if, we, if, we, if we're not aware of things, if we're not conscious of things, that he, he's like, well, I can't talk to them about about that so directly because they don't have a context for that. But if, if I have been considering our missionaries, if I am aware of them, th- then he can remind us to pray for them and, and he can increase our prayer burden for them. So I, I, one of the reasons why we want our missionaries to be household names is so that you would be praying for them. I, I, I always remember my, my little grandmother going in, in her, her bedroom and going to uh, the little vanity mirror where she would do her, her makeup and her hair and, and remember seeing the missionary cards surrounding the mirror where, where she would pray for them as she would do her hair, as she would get, get ready for church, the various things that women do in front of the mirror. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't presume to know or understand that. I just, I, I know that it happens. Um, uh, and and I, just the, the impression it made on me that I knew there was a, a little lady on a farm in Dillwyn, Virginia, praying for missionaries around the world. And today we're, we're, we're going to look at a passage, uh, a couple of passages, where, where Paul requests prayer for himself. Now, I, I want you to just, for, for a second, if you can, put yourself in the shoes of the original hearer. The, the person who received the letter from Paul, out of, out of all of Paul's epistles, about half of his epistles, he requests prayer from the people he's writing a letter to. Now, I, I would imagine if, if I knew Paul, I'd be the one trying to get on his prayer list. But he's like, I, I want to be on your prayer list. Can, can you, I, the Apostle Paul, am requesting prayer from you fledgling church that I planted, that I'm writing this letter, and there's a good chance if Paul's writing you a letter, he's probably rebuking something in the process of writing that letter. But he asked for prayer. So I find that rather significant that Paul is, is asking for prayer. And, and as I, I went through the half dozen or so very specific prayer requests that Paul makes uh, in his epistles, they really can filter into two categories. Uh, they're, 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 and we're, we're going to look at one, one verse from each of those two categories today. The, the first category of prayer that he asked for is prayer for ministry effectiveness. Prayer for ministry effectiveness. In Colossians chapter 4, verses 3 through 4, it says this. At the same time, 
Pray also for us that God would open to us a door for the word and to declare the mystery of Christ on the account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. So in the context of Colossians 4, he's already encouraging them to be people of prayer. He's telling them to pray, pray without ceasing. Be, be people of prayer. And hey, while you're at it, while you're being such awesome people of prayer, pray for me. He tells them, pray, pray for me. And he tells them to open, he says, pray for a couple of things. One, pray for open doors. Pray, pray that I have the ability to speak and to minister. Pray, pray that I would walk through the right door, the right doors would be open to me, and I would have an opportunity to share the gospel. You know, a lot of the missionaries that, that we support are, are in countries that are designated as, as closed or sensitive. Uh, generally speaking, you and I live, live in a society where doors are relatively open to us. But they, they live in places where they, they're constantly seeing closed opportunities. And, and they, they need the Lord to supernaturally open opportunities of ministry for them. So one of the things that we are praying for when we pray for our, our, our missionaries is that God would open up doors that seem to be shut. That, that when doors are open to them, that they would have the discernment and the knowledge to say, ah, that's an open door. Let me walk through it. Let me speak to the situation. The second thing Paul says here in this prayer for ministry effective is not only would doors be open, but he prayed that he might declare the word of God with clarity. Now, could you imagine being the Colossian church receiving this? Uh, a church that was planted because the Apostle Paul came and preached the gospel to you. You received it with clarity. Now he's sort of like a, a bit of a, a superhero to you. He's a little bit of a father figure to you. And like, wow, Paul, you're asking me to pray that you would be a good preacher. I know that you're a good preacher, Paul, because you preached and I got saved. But Paul acknowledges the fact that he needs prayer in order that he would communicate the gospel effectively. We, we need help. We need the help of God to clearly communicate the gospel. So I mean, You've probably experienced this. Sometimes when I'm sharing the gospel with somebody, I, I all of a sudden am speaking something that the, I can tell the clarity of thought that I'm speaking with isn't my own. Like, like, like I'm saying something and something is coming out real clear and I'm like, that, that not only is helping to make it clear to them, it's making it clear to me right now. Uh, like that, that's real good. I'm going to write that down later when I'm on my own. Like there, there, there are times where, where God is just speaking through you and bringing clarity. So one of the things we're praying for them as we're praying for ministry effectiveness is that they would communicate the gospel clearly. The second category of prayers the Apostle Paul uh, requests quite often is, is prayers for, of protection. Prayers of protection. I said, if, when you look at these two categories, it was about split even between the two uh, categories of prayer. Here's, here's one of them from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. It says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, <clears throat> of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received a sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such deadly peril, and he delivered us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You, will, you also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted through the prayers of many. So here in this passage, before Paul begins requesting prayer for the situation that he's in now, he, he takes a moment and reflects back on a testimony of God delivering him in the past. He says, I don't want you guys to be unaware of back when we were in Asia Minor that, that, that we were under such great and heavy persecution, we, we thought we were done for. Most uh, church uh, theologians believe that what he's referring to is Acts 19 when uh, there was a whole multitude of people in Ephesus ready to kill him because he stood uh, against uh, the, 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 the worship of Artemis. But he, he says... I felt as though I was under the sentence of death. He, he looked upon himself as a man condemned to die. 
Now, one of the other interesting cross-references there is uh, if you look at a few other passages, right about then his, his health wasn't real great. So could you imagine you've got a whole city raging against you, wanting to kill you. You're probably already weak from sickness. And he's like, man, I, I thought I was good as dead, but I, I looked. My, I, I, the only hope I had was I relied on the God who is able to raise the dead. Now, it's... When I was studying this verse this week, uh, most theologians are split on what he meant by that. Did, did he mean the, the, the resurrection, so the resurrection of the dead at the end when all who are dead in Christ will rise? Or was he referring to like people who, like Paul literally saw people raised from the dead? One of my favorite stories is the Apostle Paul is teaching. He bores this kid to sleep, and he falls out the window and lands on the ground and dies. And Paul goes down there, resurrects the kid, and goes right back to teaching. Like, you know you're on an important part when you don't let a simple resurrection interrupt what you're teaching on, right? Like, he, he is, I, I'm not done, guys. Y'all, don't, y'all are too excited about this kid dying and coming back to life. So well, whether, whether he's referring to that level of resurrection or the great resurrection, either one, he said, I, I have hope in God. Even though I feel like I'm sentenced to death, I still have hope in God. He, he, he brings this story up as he's about to say, I need you to pray for me again. It says, verse 11, you also must help us in prayer so that we will be able to give thanks for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. See, Paul, Paul not only believed that God delivered him in the past, but God would deliver him again. And, and he believed that the Corinthian church's prayers were so important that they could affect Paul's work. If you pray for me. God's going to move in my work, and he's going to continue using me, and I'll continue to live. It, it, Paul believed that the prayers of the Corinthian church was important because it, it would lead to Paul's deliverance. If you guys will stand with me and pray, God will deliver me again. And Paul, ultimately, he said he believed that the Corinthian church, his prayers were important, ultimately, to the glory of God. He says, not only do I believe that God will deliver me again because you pray, but because you pray and because many of have prayed, when that testimony comes forward, uh, that so many of us banded together, we prayed and we see God's deliverance, many more people will thank God because of my deliverance. I want to just t- take a moment just to look at these two principles. In a moment, I have, I have Bob come up and he's going to share a story of in his own missionary journey of, of why it was important to have the, tr- the body of believers praying for him. But when we look at Paul, he, he placed a high premium on, yes, I'm supposed to be out here doing this work. Yes, this is my role. I'm an apostle. I'm, I'm planting the church where it isn't. But it is absolutely vital for me to have a prayer team supporting me everywhere I go. And, it, and he asked for prayer for ministry effectiveness, and he prayed, asked for prayers of protection. So Bob's going to come. He's going to share with you guys real quick a, a, a story. And then, then when he's done, I'm going to come back up here, and we're, he and I are going to chat together for a little while, and you guys get to listen in. Good morning. I've never shared this story in public before. I've written it down, so the details are clear. It all started in the 80s, 1980s, Virginia Tech, University Christian Fellowship. Andy, Yesman, and I were students and young believers in Jesus. Andy committed himself to missions, but he never went overseas. He never went overseas as a missionary. Instead, he committed himself to follow Yesman and me and pray for us. He eventually moved to Texas where he started his own business and a family. We went to Africa and translated the New Testament and parts of the Old Testament for the Karang people. It took 30 years. God gave Andy the power to remain faithful to his commitment until we finished in 2020. And God used Andy mightily at just the right time. Here's how. From 2000 to 2005, the translation project was gaining momentum and things were looking promising. But one day, 
some young men showed up with shotgun wounds in their backs. Next, a man's house was destroyed, demolished. Next, a report of attempted rape. She escaped, but fell and lost the baby in her womb. Another man was shot out of a tree. There were temporary villages burned to the ground. More stories reached us of electrocutions and whippings and poisonings. These crimes were being committed against the Karang people by foreigners. Europeans who managed tourist hunting camps on the Karang homeland. And worse yet, these foreigners, ex these exploiters were benefiting from anti-poaching funds from the world's biggest wildlife protection organization. This is a secular organization that you all know, but out of precaution, I will not name. They have a huge presence in Washington, D.C. and all over the world. The poor and exploited Karang, however, had no voice. They pleaded with us for help. So we helped them document 21 human rights abuses, thinking that the government of their country would be appalled and come to the aid of their own citizens. We were wrong. And we found out just how deep the corruption went as we prepared in 2005 to go back to Blacksburg for a one-year furlough. Yesman had gone home three weeks earlier while I stayed behind in the village to secure our compound for years' absence. Then one week before my departure, I was summoned, along with several Karang village chiefs, to a meeting by government officials. At that public meeting, the Karang chiefs were intimidated. I was accused of inciting a rebellion against the government, running a poaching operation, and I was handed a summons for my wife, who before leaving the country had trespassed into a hunting camp to rescue young men from being tortured. I hold on to this summons as a testimony of God's love for the Karang people, because things looked very grim. In fact, the village chiefs fully expected me to be assassinated within the next week. This had happened to other missionaries before. On the way home from the meeting, I still remember the chief of Masi, Tiba Andre, saying, Kehule, nahuzing ni, if he dies, will die with him. In time, we learned that we had stepped on big toes all the way to the capital city. I thought, <clears throat> if I get out alive, would we ever be allowed back in the country? Would we be on a blacklist? Is this the way God's enemy was going to stop the translation of the Karang scriptures? I was terrified. I got a message to Yasmin saying that if I disappeared or was found dead, she would know why. I was a mess. <clears throat> but obviously, I made it Blacksburg safely. <laughs> God protected me. <laughs> and on my own initiative, I went to Washington, D.C. to try to speak with the Secular Wildlife Protection Organization about the human rights abuses, but I felt very intimidated. Why would they even listen to me, a missionary? After a series of secretaries, I was told that the people in charge of that part of Africa were not available. They were traveling. I went back to Blacksburg very discouraged. But God had set something else in motion through Andy. 
a much better plan. You see, Yesman and I were desperate for prayer. It was during that year home that we learned who were our true prayer warriors. And, God, and the Lord raised up new people, too. Like many of the fireplace missionaries, we could not share openly about our situation. We shared strategically with those who we thought would pray over this drastic situation. This is where I turn back to Andy, who had been praying and following us for close to 25 years. One day in Blacksburg, he called me from Texas. Hey, Bob, how can I pray for you? I told him about some family concerns and personal items. After praying together, he asked, is that all, Bob? It's like there's something else you need to tell me. Well, in fact, Andy, there is. And I spent over an hour detailing all the abuses and how I had been accused and that I was not sure we could get back into the country. He was intensely interested and asked good questions. When I told Andy about the wildlife organization and my attempt to bring it all to their attention, Andy went quiet. Hello? Andy, you there? He was actually stunned, and he told me why. Bob, the president and the CEO of that organization is my friend. We eat Thanksgiving dinner together. And yes, they are not missionary friendly, but write up a summary of all those abuses and send it to me. I will edit it and send it to him. In two weeks, I was called to Washington by that organization. I now was in the office of the man I tried to see earlier. He said, we use your mission's airplanes to do our animal surveys. We will send a diplomatic message to the government of that country. I left amazed by God's intervention through Andy. A year after having received Yesman's summons, backed by the prayers of the saints, we landed in that country. No hassles. Then we traveled north by land to the government office that issued the summons. We heard whispers as we walked into the building. Nasara Karang, Nasara Karang, which means the Karang white man, the Karang white man. I saw no familiar faces. All the personnel who had accused and threatened us were no longer there. Even the official who signed the original summons was gone. No explanation. I remember handing this summons to the official who replaced him. We have come here because your office summoned us, I declared. On what charges, he inquired. I replied, it is you, sir, who need to inform us. Immediately, he handed back the summons, folded his hands, and said, there is nothing on you on our archives, you are free to go. When we arrived back in the village, we learned how the local officials there had also been replaced. The only opposition left was a foreign manager of a hunting zone. And a few years later, God worked another miracle to remove him from the picture. But that's another story. Within a few years, the abuses to the Karang people were reduced considerably. The story does not end there. We had other spiritual attacks, but we knew we had an army of committed prayer warriors going before us. And along with Andy, they carried us through to the completion of the Karang New Testament, which God's Spirit is using in a revival among the Karang youth today. And that's how God used a committed prayer, praying believer named Andy who stayed at home to reach the Karang people with his love in the heart of Africa. Well, 
That, that's just an amazing story. And I, I want to make sure you guys caught the detail that Andy was a classmate of yours in college. So like the, these, these college friendships, relationships that, that last a lifetime and have completely, like, like we have Bob today because a classmate of his prayed for him and kept him alive. You know, um, I just want to ask just a, a few, few questions. Um, and, and just uh, you can, you can take, take as long as you want to answer any of them. Um, but fr- from your perspective, what, what does partnership in prayer look like? Um, and Yasmin, if you want to add anything, <laughs> you can come up here. Uh, for me, it's very much why I use this example of Andy, because he was, it was, we were not just a picture on, an, on a refrigerator. He communicated with us, uh, and he took an active role in making that a possibility. And I think that that's really important. Yasmin, do you have something to add? Practically, what it looked like is <clears throat> by that time we had email communication. So we would send us a paragraph of what was happening regularly back at home. We also had a pastor at that time who, who took one day a week to pray. Not just for us, he did that. And, and uh, when there were other things that happened, the Lord revealed to him, and he'd ask, was this done, was this done? And yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's what it looked like. So along the same lines, um, how, how can people stay informed so they can pray effectively for, for missionaries? Okay, so uh, practically speaking for you guys, <laughs> I take the missionaries that you support to heart. And that's why I've kind of jumped into that, because we know what it's like. And so one way that you can do it is when they are here, when they are here, make sure to welcome them. Make sure to get to know them. Right now we have the Halberts here, and they live in West Virginia, but I think they're going to visit us sometime. Make sure to know them. Invite them over for a meal and get to know their kids, get to know their issues, uh, and that will go to your heart. It will stay in your heart, and the Lord will use that. Um, <clears throat> Secondly, take an active effort even though it might be somebody you've never met, and there they are in your refrigerator, look at that address, look at the email, and say, hey, maybe I can just write a a note of encouragement, send them a verse or something, ask them how they're doing, how are the kids, you know? And you might get a response back, they might be too busy. But if you get a response back, keep the correspondence going. Even if it's just one phrase, you know? Maybe they don't have time to read a whole paragraph, you know? (laughs) So... Anything else? About communication. I thought the question was how to pray. Yeah, just how, how would people stay infor- informed uh, so they can pray effectively? I think it's difficult to stay informed. I think you just need to give yourself to it. You know, the things that you want prayer for, you pray for them. You need prayer for your walk. You pray for their walks. You know, it's easy to be distracted. Um, They are under spiritual attack. You pray the blood of Jesus over them and protect them. You know, watch their minds. Watch your mind, you know. And one of the, one of the fun things I've gotten to watch as as Bob's helped us uh, spearhead some of this connectivity with our missionaries is I, I get the same newsletters that he gets from our missionaries, but he gets more information from them than I do because he's he's been very proactive in just in responding to them, letting them know that and and, and they're, they're like All right, we've got somebody that we really know is praying for us. We'll give us we'll give him our real prayer request, and it's been it's been awesome to watch. Um, 
there's been multiple Sundays where, where one of our missionaries had a, had a, had a right now need. They'd, they'd email uh, Bob and, and myself, and we, we would know that Sunday morning to pray for them for a situation that they were going through. So that, that proactive step. Um, what, what are just some, some practical tools or methods people can use to stay faithful Long term in the place of intercession and prayer for our missionaries. You know, like I shared the story about my granny with the little prayer cards around her uh, vanity mirror. There, but what are some some ways that just people can lock that in as part of their spiritual discipline to stay faithful in, in the place of intercession? Well, I know that here you have this thing called Discord, yeah. right? And if you go on there, you'll see where I, I'm trying to keep uh, an updated. Uh, thread going on the new things that come in uh, uh, for a mission. It's a missions update. Get on that. Go there. See what's new. I'm going to... Turn your notifications on. Okay. Turn your, he says turn your notifications on. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Pictures do help. Uh, if you get their news, uh, sometimes writing it down again so you, you remember... You know, or just have some form of when you do your regular prayers, just to always say, okay, what about the missionaries? And go back to those updates and things like that. Make it part of your regular life. Do you have anything? (laughs) We're old. And uh, there are, Andy has made it through, and he's a committed person to the Lord. But many have fallen aside, you know. And as I watch kids in Chi Alpha, Crew, Ivy, you know, my kids' generations, I don't know of my kids' generation who have made it. It starts now with your walk. You need to know, give yourself every day to finding out who is this father? What is he like? If you don't know God, you're not going to know how to pray. And if I might add, we've often had people who gave us a word by email. Like, Here's a word the Lord gave me. And those kind of things are like water in a desert land. You know? uh, another question for you. Have, uh, this is one I prepped you for, so I'll, I'll kill time for a little while if you need to think of an example. But have you ever had a moment where somebody was praying for you and you just knew it? Like they didn't call you and say, hey, I was praying for you today. But you, you were in a, in, in a moment of ministry something went right or something went wrong and you were protected from what went wrong. It's, you ever had a moment where it's like, obviously somebody is praying for me. And then later on you found out, yes, in fact, uh, uh, some, somebody was praying in that moment that kept us safe or, or we saw provision. We arrived to Africa when our youngest was eight kilos. At the end of one year, she was seven and a half kilos and not walking. And we were getting ready to come home because we could not find what the problem was. God did several things, but one of the things was my own mother who prays for us and would She said, don't come home. She's being demonized. She needs to be exorcised. We went to a church. I I would go to this revival service where a Cameroonian pastor would lead in the afternoons with my good friend. And one day this woman comes up to me while we're at the revival service, it was prayer and praise. 
and we were there praying, and she didn't know me from Adam. She only saw me there with my friend that we went. She didn't know I had a husband. She didn't know I had children, nothing. And she comes up to me and says, your daughter's being demonized. You need to bring her to be exorcised. So we did the next week, but you know, these are things where people just, they didn't know anything and, and they came. By the way, she is extremely spiritually sensitive, so ask Nellie. Yeah, our, yeah, that, our daughter is our gem, and yes, the Lord did do that, and she was delivered. All right. And any thoughts that you want to add to something that I don't have a question prepped for you, but something that you'd like to share just in terms of encouraging people uh, to pray, how to pray, effectiveness in prayer? All I can say is that commitment is the key. Every day, all the time. That's all I can say. And the Lord will empower you just like he did with Andy and so many other people who are praying for us. He'll give you the power to do it. He'll, he'll, he'll give you the strength. And there will be many times you don't want to read your scriptures. You don't want to pray too bad. <laughs> you just do it. You, you say, okay, God, I'm here. Awesome. Thanks so much. I'll give her a hand real quick. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're going to uh, share, uh, I told you guys last week, I shared like six different projects that we've got going on during our Kingdom Builders campaign in, for the next three weeks this week and the next two weeks. We're going to highlight two of them in particular. And one, one of them that we're going to highlight today is actually somebody that Bob is friends with. So I'm going to let him uh, highlight this ministry. It's funny because these friends, they live in a closed country and they work with media and translating uh, into the language of that country, the major language of that country. And uh, we actually knew them and they knew about our problem at that time too. So <laughs> it's interesting that we're talking about them today. But they want to translate a series called The Saddleback Kids into the language of that country. They want to dub it. They want to make those videos. And they also want to develop a... Um, a, a Sunday school uh, curriculum based on that. And so uh, that is one of the things that we have in the Kingdom Builders campaign. Um, if it's okay, I could share a real quick concern that they had just Friday, because they're doing many different medias, many different things in medias, and Christmas is coming up. So this is a kind of timely uh, prayer request. I have two important prayer requests with one being especially pressing. First, the main character we had planned for our Christmas video backed out today, that was Friday, just a day before the scheduled shoot. While I'm thankful she made this decision now instead of later, especially given the significance of this project, it has left us at a crossroads. This video through advertisements is expected to reach nearly one million people and could deeply impact lives, including hers. We are praying for wisdom and discernment about whether to move forward with an older female character instead. Second, the weather has been cloudy and rainy. While cloudy skies align with the aesthetics, we're aiming for, we're aiming for rain could limit what we're able to accomplish. Please pray for favorable weather conditions during the shoot. Awesome. And so once again, they, they, some, of, some of their costs for one of their translations of one of their videos is one of the things that we're, we're giving to in, in this particular campaign. Uh, the second ministry we want to highlight today that the, our, our campaign is going to be giving to is Aki's Place. I mentioned you guys last week. Aki's Place is probably uh, Fireplace Church's longest running project. When we launched uh, back in 2016, back in the elementary school, our, our, the very first uh, foreign missionary we ever picked up uh, was a missionary who, at that point in time, he was overseeing Aki's place. And and so we, we, have, we have followed them even since uh, Mel and Jillian are no longer at, at 
in Bangladesh where Oxus Places today. They've moved uh, to Springfield, and we'll share some of their stuff with you in the future as well. Uh, but we, we've continued to track along with Oxus Place. Oxus Place, uh, if you guys aren't familiar with it, it more or less, they, they rescue little girls who are, are born to mothers who work in brothels. Um, you you got to imagine if you're a little girl growing up in a brothel, uh, the, the outlook for your life is grim. Right? Like you, you don't have a lot of career choice there. And, and, and one of the things that they do is they, they go in and, and basically adopt these girls out of the brothel. They have a, a, a group home set up for them uh, so that they don't have to live there any longer, so they can be raised in a Christ, Christian atmosphere. They actually receive counseling uh, for, for the, some of the trauma they've experienced from their childhood. Uh, it's an amazing, amazing ministry that helps them uh, walk through this process. And what, 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 one of the things I, I love uh, about having tracked with them these last eight years some of the little girls that they rescued eight years ago, back when we first started uh, walking with them, they, these girls are, are teenagers now. They, they're, they're big sisters to the new girls that are coming into the program. They, they love the Lord. They, it, the, where, where Aki's place is located is actually on the, the property of, of a larger church there in that city. Um, and so the, these girls are uh, in, in the church every time the doors are open. They, it just just a, a, a massive shift in their life. And so not only... Is it just this amazing, you know, feel-good humanitarian thing, which if that motivates you, great, but it's, it's more than that. It's evangelism. It's discipleship. You're reaching lost people who would not have heard the gospel otherwise and, and they're training them up in the, in the ways of the Lord. And I, I can't tell you the amount of times I've seen care ministries like that move into regions that wouldn't allow traditional outreach to occur and, and and the, the the young people that would reach in orphanages and everything like that become the leaders. Uh, one, one of my favorite ministries in in Egypt was Lillian Thrasher, who set up a an orphanage there. And e- even through like all the turmoil, the political turmoil that Egypt went through through the past few years, because they so honored her her heritage there, they they wouldn't destroy her her. Uh, orphanage when they were destroying churches and everything else. And what's amazing is the, the little orphans that she reached years and years ago are now all of like the leaders, the bishops, the pastors, the elders of, 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 the, of the national church there. So when, when I, I think about that ministry in Egypt, and I, and I think about what we're talking about here in Bangladesh, yeah, we're, we're, we're rescuing girls out of a really negative situation, but we're also raising up the next generation of, of spiritual mothers in that nation. So... Um, I think we'd be uh, remiss if we talked about prayer and we shared these stories with you and we didn't pray for them, right? Uh, So so if if you would, just wherever you're at, just just, just stand your feet. and We're we're, going to take a moment and pray pray for both of these two two ministries. Um, And and, uh, uh, Gloria, Gloria, did did we give out all of these? Were there any left in the basket? Okay. Okay, I'm going to make some more of those for next week. So if you didn't get one and you want one, I'll make sure you have them. But one of the things I want to encourage you to do is is go go ahead and just just sort of put put eyes on, on the. Um on, on some of those pictures there, whether it's the little, the little cartoon of the Saddleback Kids that the, the couple that Bob was referring to is going to be dubbing and translating and creating the curriculum for, or uh, that, that picture above Aki's place, those, those are actual, uh, you can't see faces there, but those are, those are two girls actually from the program. So we're, we're going to take a moment, we're going, we're going to spend some time just, just asking the Lord to touch these ministries. In the same way that we, we saw the, these two principles through the Apostle Paul, that we'd pray for ministry effectiveness, but also pray for safety. We're going we're to pray for that for both of these two ministries. Let's, let's start. We're going to pray for uh, the, the, the work of, of the couple Bob was telling us about. God, we thank you for them. And we, we thank you for, for all, uh, the, the way you're, you're using the, the media. The guys, this isn't listening to Pastor Alvin pray time. You guys are praying too. Come on. Lord, we, th- we thank you for the, for the way that, that we, we are seeing you use their ministry, God, not just in, in their nation, but the surrounding nations everywhere that that satellite can beam these programs to, the way you're, you're speaking uh, the, the gospel truth to people who, who uh, don't, don't have a, a living witness in, in their neighborhood, but they're, they're, there's a, a message being beamed into their neighborhood. They are receiving uh, your word via television and via the internet, Lord. But I pray 
that as, as they are, are preparing for this Christmas outreach and this Christmas video, God, I, I pray that although their main character backed out in the last moment, God, I pray that, that, you, that you bring them a, a new lead character, a new, a new lead actor that, that when, when it's all said and done, we'll see your providence and we'll see your wisdom. And uh, I was supposed to have been that person all along and you did something unique and special because of the new person you put in that place. I pray for them as they are preparing to to translate and dub and create curriculum for Saddleback Kids. Uh, we, we thank you uh, for the opportunity to teach kids the Bible all around the world, Lord. I thank you that, that you're going to translate, help them translate this effectively, pick the right words and the right phrases that, that carry the, the, the meaning uh, of the words well, that communicate effectively. God, the same thing the Apostle Paul prayed for. Give me clarity of thought so that I can proclaim the gospel with all clarity so I can communicate as I should. Lord, I pray that you would help them do that right now, that they would have the opportunity to communicate clearly the word of God. God, I pray for protection, Lord. I I pray in in the same way that there are people around them that do not appreciate the fact that they are communicating the gospel and that people from false religions are being converted to Christianity because of their ministry. God, I pray that you would protect them. You'd give them wisdom. You'd give them discernment as they are communicating. God, we thank you that that you have delivered them before and you can deliver them again, Lord. We, We just pray that you move powerfully in their midst. God, we also pray for Aki's place. God, we, we thank you for the, the little girls who we, we've gotten to watch grow up from a distance, Lord. God, over the years that they've been rescued from this, from this place that, uh, of, of, of sin, this place of, of hurtfulness, this place that, that, you know, that your, your people scooped them out of and brought them and, and put them in a place of warmth and a place of, of caring, a place of discipleship and nurturing, Lord. God, I thank you that, that you, you put it on somebody's heart to, to start Aki's place in the first um, place. God, I thank you that you've, you've used this ministry over the years, God. And we, we pray for them. God, as they are as they are raising funds to add on to the building, God, as they are raising funds to to so that they can make a few more bids to rescue a few more girls that, that, that it doesn't have to end with the few that they've got, but they can keep on their mission and keep on growing and keep on reaching more girls, discipling them. God, I pray that, that you would use uh, Stephanie. I pray that you'd use others who are, are spearheading this process to raise the funds. God, I pray that not only would we be able to contribute in a, in a considerable way, God, but I pray that you'd raise up other men and women of God all across this nation who would, who would send funds and, and help this process out. Lord, God, I pray for protection there as well, God, that the, 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 the enemy does not like that he has had people stolen from him. God, I pray that you'd protect them. God, keep them safe in the midst of the, their, their deliverance. Keep them safe in the midst of their discipleship and growing them up, Lord. God, I pray for safety in that nation. God, I thank you for ministry friends of ours who are returning from that nation, Lord, and I pray that you bless them on their travels home, Lord. God, I pray that we, we can uh, find out more about what's going on there soon, and God, so that we can, like we talked about today, continue to pray effectively for them. Lord, I thank you for this. I thank you that, that uh, you, you, would, you would lay burdens on our heart, that we would pray, and God, we would see amazing things done. We thank you for that in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Before, before I dismiss this morning, I got, I got one testimony I want to share real quick. But, uh, Bob, he shared from, from his end of the field where, where he was on the field and people here were praying for him. I want to share a, a quick story of us, us here praying and seeing things move on the field. Uh, when, I, when I was a young adult pastor in Farmville, we, we committed to praying for uh, the Zanzibar Swahili, the people of Zanzibar, and, and then we adopted them as a people group. And one, one night, we were, a Monday night, we were in a coffee shop, and we had a prayer meeting, and we were praying. And I, I remember, like, I, I want to do something to inspire these guys to pray effectively. So I, I pulled up a YouTube clip of something that was happening in Zanzibar at the time that was a, a very real prayer need. Well, I remember after we watched it, just watching the young adults very moved. We did like sort of rapid fire prayer where I just handed the mic and like somebody would pray and then they'd hand the mic to the next person they'd pray. And we went through about 10 or 12 people. And I remember them praying some really, really specific prayers over a very specific situation. Well, like six months later, I got to go to Zanzibar and I, I went to, to the pastor's church that was directly affected by the situation. And I was like, hey, man. I need to ask you about something I saw on YouTube. <laughs> and he's like, 
yeah, that was real. That, that, that was a really dangerous situation for us. Can, but can I tell you how God broke through in the situation? There was a Muslim cleric there that was declare, wanted to declare Sharia law there in Zanzibar. Even though they're part of Tanzania and have their government, he was like, we're, we're going to break off and declare Sharia law. He said, can I tell you something that happened? In the middle of the night, that cleric calls Pastor Dixon up on the phone. He says, hey, do you know who I am? He goes, yeah, yeah, I know exactly who you are. He goes, I am... My wife is going to die, and the doctors can't figure out what's wrong with her. But I hear if people come to your church, they get healed. Is that true? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah we, we see healings quite often. He goes, well, can you pray for my wife? He goes, yeah, just come over to the church. And so they, they come in all cloak and dagger in the middle of the night. You know, uh, he, he lays hands on the cleric's wife, instantaneously delivered. She's still alive to this day. But I remember some of the prayers that we prayed in a coffee shop in Farmville, Virginia, that were so specific to that situation. A lot of times you throw those prayer bombs and you never know what happens on the other end, right? You're like, God, do this really audacious, awesome thing. It's really cool sometimes you actually get to hear about it. God, God actually lets you, lets you. So I want to I encourage you bo- both from, from the end that Bob shared with you of, of receiving the prayer, but also getting to hear, man, our prayers are actually effective. You're, 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 you're launching these bombs and you're, you're saying, God, do this amazing, miraculous, audacious thing. He does.